Welcome to this episode of Retirement Crusaders. Today, I want to discuss the five things that Neil and I have seen the most common mistakes during people's retirement when we were financial advisors. So the first one is investing short term. Now, investing short term is very expensive. For some reason, as people age, they think their, their lifespan is become shortened which in general is true, but is not perceived correctly. For example, somebody age 60 has a 20 year life expectancy. So it would be foolish for them to just invest in securities that had a one or two year horizon when they have a 20 year lifespan. They shouldn't be buying one year CDs. They should be buying 20 year bonds or preferred stocks or something long term to match their life expectancy. Let me share with you a couple issues about life expectancy that a lot of people don't quite understand or they're not haven't been informed about. The first thing is if we look at this table of life expectancy, we see that a male age 60 is expected to live another 20 years. However, if that male reaches age 80, he's expected to live another seven years. So the longer you live, the longer you're expected to live. So life expectancy for most people is longer than they think because at age 60, they think, well, I'll only be around another 20 years. Then once they get to age 80, the data would forecast that you're going to be around another seven years. So the longer you live, the longer you're expected to live. And this is even more true with a married couple. Let me show you. So <clears throat> here's a couple, Fred and Ethel. Fred's 63 and Ethel is 62. Now, <clears throat> let's say, let's look at what their probabilities are when they get to age 90. So when Fred's 90 and Ethel is 89, let me show you something. There is a 44% chance that either, that one of them will still be alive at age 90. That, so almost half. So I want you to understand that not only is life expectancy normally longer than you think, but with married couples, the probability of one of you being alive for a very long time is very significant. In fact, if we look at, let's see here, when Fred would be 96 and Ethel 95, the probability of one of them being alive is 14% or one out of seven. So not insignificant. So you not definitely, if you're married, think that one of you has a very, very good chance of living, you know, beyond 90. Please plan for that. So our advice is always invest in securities that match your life expectancy because you want to run out before your money rather than have your money run out before you. Now, if you like this type of advice on mistakes to avoid in retirement, please click the subscribe button below and the bell icon so you get notified each time we post a video. And below in the description, make sure to click. We've got 10 different booklets on different retirement topics. Absolutely free. Click and enjoy them. They're great education in very quick reads, very simple English. Now, some people would say, but short term rates are so good right now, I can't resist. Well, let's take a look at something. So here we see the yield curve of U.S. Treasury securities, which shows us that one month Treasury securities yield just under 5%, whereas 30 year Treasury securities yield only 3.7% or so. So one would say, well, Larry, I should be buying these short term securities because they pay more. My answer would be that may be true today, but it's hardly ever true. So let me just, for example, change right here. We're looking at the yield curve on May 3rd, 2023. Let's back it up a year. This is what the yield curve normally looks like. Here we see one month treasury securities at a half a percent and 30 years at 3%. So that would be six times as much income. 
on a long-term security as short-term. And that's the way it usually is. Let's back this up another year. Here's 2021 in May. You earn almost nothing on a one month and uh, almost three and a half percent or it was three percent on a 30 year security. If we back it up another year, same thing. So as we see, what's normally true is that over time, short term securities pay a lot less than long term securities. Therefore, you should be thinking long term to get better interest. Now, this is not true just with treasury securities. It's true with all securities in general. For example, if you bought bonds, a longer term bond pays more interest than a shorter term bond. So again, match your investments to your life expectancy. Now, the next thing we've seen is that people, for some strange reason, spread their money all over the place. It makes them feel safer. This is not a good idea. For example, I have all of my securities at one brokerage firm, at Interactive Brokers. Now, they're in different accounts because one's a regular IRA, one's a SEP IRA, one was a rollover, one's an inherited IRA, and then I've got other money that's not IRA. But the beauty of that is I can log on and see everything on one screen. It helps me be much more organized and strategic with what I'm doing by not having things spread around and having them in one place. Now, some people might say, but oh, isn't it extra risk to have money in one place? No, if you wanna look it up, there's something called SPIC, SIPC insurance on brokerage accounts. You can look that up. And what about banks? Well, you don't have to have 18 different banks, even if you had the uh, only the insured amount at a bank up to 250,000, because a married couple can actually get $3 million in bank deposits insured. How do you do that? Below in the description, you'll see a link to our booklets. And one of the booklets is called the CD Shopper's Guide. And we show you how a married couple can actually divide their accounts to get $3 million worth of FDIC insurance in one bank account. What are the other reasons not to spread everything around? Well, sometimes it'll create extra fees. So you have more fees, you have a fee at each institution. Also, you may lose out on certain benefits. For example, I keep, I always get, I have all my accounts in one bank and I'm always getting promotions from that bank saying, well, you have enough with us that if you got a mortgage with us, it would be a quarter percent or a half a percent less interest because I have enough there. Or they say, if you open a brokerage account with us, then I would have this extra benefit of, I don't remember, less commissions or something like that. So because I have a concentration of money in one bank, they're always giving me some benefits. So that's a, a, a reason to focus on fewer financial institutions. Not only can you keep yourself more organized, but you can extract certain benefits you get from having your a relationship that's more focused and concentrated with one institution. Now, here's a big one. Number three, we've seen this too many times and it's very costly for retirees. Stop giving your kids money. Now, let me make a distinction. If you give them a one-time gift, maybe to buy a house, or maybe it's to start a business, or something of that order, that's okay. But it's this money that goes to help them meet their living expenses. You have got to stop that. You may think you're being nice, you may think it's your job as a parent, but it is detrimental not only to you, but to them. Now, there's a well-known book called The Millionaire, the Millionaire Next Door, written by author Tom Stanley. And I want to show, now he has studied, you know, people's money habits for many, many years. And I want to share with you his opinion about giving money to your kids. Here's what he says. First, he calls giving money to your children economic outpatient care. And what he says is, in general, the more dollars adult children receive, the fewer they accumulate, while those who are given fewer dollars accumulate more. A simple rule of EOC, it is much easier to spend other people's money than dollars that are self-generated. The more EOC, the more financially dependent your children become. So do you want to create independent children or dependent children? Stop giving them money. 
It's not helpful to you and it's not helpful to them. We even saw one couple uh, extend themselves to agree to a degree, giving their uh, son money. They had to actually sell their house. They now live in a rental property because they became so depleted from financial resources by overindulging their son. Please stop this. Next issue, having low or no yield assets. So for example, let's say you have a piece of raw land. Now, if you rent out that raw land, great, and you're getting income, super. But if you're not, what is the return on raw land? It's zero. In fact, it's worse than zero because you have to pay property taxes. So that is an asset that has a negative rate of return. Now you may argue, oh, but it's gone up over time. Well, that's wonderful. But how much of that can you spend? You can't. And once you're retired, cash flow becomes the name of the game. So the fact that it may be appreciating, while that's great, it's not putting any money in your pocket. You can't take a vacation with it. You can't go out to dinner with it. So we advise get rid of of assets that have no return. Now, let me give you another one that a lot of retirees have and they overlook it completely, home equity. Now, most people think home equity is a good thing. It's not, let me explain. Let's say your home is worth a million dollars and between last year and this year, it goes up 10%. Well, you just made 10% on a million if you sell your house, okay? Now, what I just said is true, whether or not you have a mortgage on that property, whether you have a million dollars worth of equity or a hundred thousand dollars worth of equity, the appreciation of a hundred thousand dollars in the last year is still the same benefit to you. But the million dollars of equity, say your house is paid off that you have sitting there earns you nothing. It's a foolish use of a million dollars. So you run around to different banks to see who's going to pay you an extra quarter percent. And then you have this million dollars that earns you zero. What can you do? Well, in my case, I'll always have a mortgage on my house. Why? Because I'm paying the bank 2.75% and I can turn around and invest that money at nine or 10% cash flow. So of course I want to pay, I keep the mortgage because I'm using the equity in my house to put money in my pocket. So the equity in your house just sitting there has no value. Another thing you could do, obviously, is sell the home. Clearly, if you sell the home and move to another home of lesser value, it's going to free up equity. Let's say you freed up a half a million dollars worth of equity. Well, 500,000 at 9%, that's $45,000 a year extra spending money in your pocket. So please look at all of your assets. Do any of them generate zero return? Get rid of them or a low rate of return? Get rid of them and get that money invested where it has a higher rate of return. Now, just a few more things that I want to mention that we've seen as mistakes over the years. Not tracking your expenses. We have a video, I want you to look at it after this video. It's called How to Track Your Expenses in Five Minutes a Month. It's using a piece of software, very inexpensive, called Quicken. There's a link below in the description. Full disclosure, I think they pay us a couple of dollars if somebody gets their software. But the beauty of Quicken is, is that once you install it, once you uh, subscribe to it, it downloads all your bank accounts, your credit cards, everything. So in five minutes a month, you can track exactly what you're spending. And if you're not tracking it, you'll probably spend more than you want. So it's a five minute a month exercise. We encourage you to do it. It'll just make you much more conscious of where your money's going and you'll be able to see it visually. Next tip. Don't have your money exposed to interest rate changes, which would not be in your favor. For example, don't have a variable rate mortgage on your house. Make sure it's a fixed rate so that you're never at the whim of the economy and rates increasing and your mortgage payment increasing. Of course, don't have any other debts other than a mortgage. Don't have credit card debt. That's insane. 
whatever they charge, 16, 18, 20 percent, you've got to get rid of that stuff right away. So the only debt you can have would be a mortgage, nothing else. Last, I want to mention the issue of when and how to claim Social Security. So there's a best time for everybody to file for Social Security. How do you know the best time? Well, the easiest thing I would recommend is if you go online and Google Social Security Maximization or Social Security Consultant or Social Security Software, you can either do it yourself. There's plenty of places that have software, pretty inexpensive, I think $40, where you put in all the information about you and your spouse and it tells you the ideal time to claim Social Security. So it does all the mathematics and tells you the best time to do that. If it's something that you can't figure out for yourself. Now, there's also the issue of how to claim Social Security, meaning uh, let's say if you were divorced, you may make more money claiming as a divorcee than claiming based on your individual earnings record. So those are mistakes people often make. And the way you can solve them, Google Social Security Consultant, and you will be able to find people who are trained in providing Social Security claiming advice, financial advisors who have that specialty, so that you can make the right decisions and get some professional help. Mm -hmm.